become a bit of a tradition. Last year, I know I didn't have a full voice, and I don't again today. I'll try to get through that. Uh, I got the cold last week. I, I don't have a fever. I'm not contagious, but uh, I just haven't had my voice recover. I'll try to get through this. I'm going to try to stay in here. They say not to get too close to the speaker. Or we'll uh, get some screeching noise. Uh, we've heard a lot about, and we'll hear a lot more about El Reno, so I'm going to not do a whole lot about that, but you've seen Mike Venice's great presentation, and certainly glad to see him and the, and the Tornado Hunt team, certainly glad, sorry to see that we lost four of our comrades uh, last year, so that's certainly a sobering uh, aspect, but as Mrs. Samaras has said, uh, Tim would have, and the family, the chasers would would want us to go on and, and learn how to do things safer, so we'll, we'll go on with that. It was a rough year, not only for that, but it was a year in which we had the fewest tornadoes on record in terms of a percentage for what's normal, so it was a pretty quiet year, making it at times rather difficult. The, uh, the mo only months that in fact were above average, if you look at the average, say, over the past 10 years, were the months of January that started off with a big and, and deadly tornado outbreak down in the Gulf Coast states. Then every month, May got close to being average, it was still below average, and then uh, October and November had tornado outbreaks that uh, had them above average. It's been pretty quiet thus far this year. So to say it was the quietest, it's hard to know what the average should have been for 1950. That's the first year of official tornado statistics, so if you exclude that, uh, certainly, percentage departure from normal was the, the quietest that we've seen. Nevertheless, as always, it's kind of like with hurricanes. It's not how many, but how many violent or how many, many like it, making landfall. And in this case, we certainly had some violent tornadoes. An EF5, I guess eight there, so <coughs> rated EF4, and then the controversies surrounding how you rate, whether you use damage or uh, the Doppler radar, mobile Doppler radar that would have measured winds not far above the ground, but were in the ES5 scale. We had uh, killer tornadoes in Oklahoma and a number of other states. Uh, I'll talk maybe a little bit about a few of the examples. What I, what I tend to do in this talk is to uh, go through and, and a few of the things that I found interesting. I'm going to try to avoid much focus on El Reno since there's so much uh, else on that. One of the other odd things or unusual things about this year was that in contrast to most years, uh, when the majority of fatalities lately have been in mobile homes, it was much different from that in uh, 2013 of the 55 direct fatalities, 33 of those were in permanent structures, homes and schools, uh, businesses, only 13 in mobile homes and 9 in vehicles, 8 of those were in the El, on the uh, El Reno day. Uh, the big tornado days did not exactly follow the, the norm, which April and May usually are the day, the months that you think will have the biggest numbers of tornadoes. Uh, in fact, January, the, the Daresville, Georgia tornado we heard we mentioned to you earlier, that 36-hour uh, period or so had 61 tornadoes. Then, November 17th, final numbers not in yet, at least. I haven't had a chance to go through the, the final monthly count just came in. 68 was the last count I had, it's something like that. Most of the other days had 40 or less. Uh, there were a lot of, uh, quite a few days though that had 25 or so tornadoes. And of course it wasn't just the tornadoes. Um, with January 30th, the most active day until we got to November, as I mentioned, but we had the largest Halloween tornado outbreak, uh, 27 plus 2 in the wee hours the next morning uh, on record. Uh, we had tornado, a lot of you I know are from the Denver area, we had a tornado go right by the uh, cross parts of the Denver airport. And uh, the rain shows that made the headlines on a number of occasions. And then for those of you local out here, uh, a devastating flood. Uh, I won't have any time to talk about that one. Uh, Tom Dolan, as by the way, in the exhibits area, I was talking to him, he has quite an interesting uh, radar and other analyses of this deadly Yarnell fire, as well as some material on the El Reno tornado. So stop by and visit him and, and all those other exhibit booths. Uh, thanks for the sponsors. One of the things that has caught my attention is sort of in press releases and curiosity in the social media about how can we predict what the tornado season is going to be or how are some of these 
monthly or seasonal or external climatic, if you will, factors affect tornadoes. And so I, I thought I would try to summarize what I personally have been able to, to go through. And we'll talk a little bit about some of those briefly. A couple of those that relate to ocean water temperature anomalies. El Nino and La Nina you've probably heard about down in the equatorial areas. There's a Pacific decadal oscillation, decadal meaning it's sort of quasi-regular with about 10 year uh, period, farther north, up in the North Pacific. And then some of the more atmospheric anomalies, the, something called PNA that sort of relates to the uh, upper air pattern over the west coast of North America, the North American oscillation, North Atlantic oscillation, jet stream up over the, over the North Atlantic and something in the jet stream more directly up in the Arctic area. So we'll take a look a little bit at that. The bottom line is none of those seem to have enough predictability in them that you can make much out of it, but I'll show you what I have been able to, to find. There's been a number of papers that have looked at El Nino, the, the ENSO, the El Nino, La Nina Southern Oscillation. We were kind of in a neutral year. We were not uh, above average. We weren't in a warm phase. Here's the equator coming off of South America. Uh, so what happens typically in the El Nino is with the warmer waters, the air rises, goes poleward, and with the warmer air here, if you like to think of it that way, and colder to the north, that the temperature pattern is such that you would get some enhancement of the uh, upper level jet stream in the areas just north of where the warm air is. And so if you look here at the latitudes, that sort of comes across the Baja, California. So in El Nino years, the, the uh, what is sometimes called the subtropical jet is faster than average. That, in some El Nino years, is meant, made for sort of winter tornado outbreaks in the Florida Peninsula, but has not, off, has not had uh, systematic effects in most other areas. If you look at individual regions, you can find some people that have studied that makes one difference or other, but the, the studies for the country as a whole have mostly said that it's uh, El Nino, La Nina don't, are not st st statistically significant. La Nina, by contrast, when the waters are cool there in the equatorial Pacific, the warmth then is displaced farther to the north off of uh, into the mid-latitudes. And so if there is an effect on the upper jet stream, you can see that it's enhanced a little bit coming up into Washington State or in some occasions maybe even all the way up into Alaska or southwest Canada. So that takes a lot of the jet stream energy north. It often is kind of a dry pattern, but sometimes gives some winter uh, severe weather activity down in the southeast. Uh, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, it's, it's different location. It's strictly in the way they define the phase, the warm phase, it's what's right offshore of North America there. Canada, Alaska, the Gulf of Alaska, down in the northwest parts of North America. Warmer than average, but a lot of the rest of the northern Pacific is below average temperature-wise, and often there's a an upper low that's over there, the Aleutian low, uh, that is uh, uh, bringing colder air then in and off, and you can see the enhanced westerly winds, and so the, this is kind of an upper low over the North Pacific area. The cold phase is uh, a bit of a reversal of the circulation, so you're getting some upwelling, some colder air coming off of the uh, North American continent, so it's cold in the water temperatures there, and uh, so the, the the way that these are defined are what's the water temperature closest to the North American continent. And looking at some of the results, as I said, for the country as a whole, the significance doesn't seem to be too significant for the El Nino-La Nina pattern, but what I've done is look at some of the, the 27 largest or highest impacts, the ones that had a lot of uh, high uh, EF scale ratings and long track mileage in the outbreaks. And the pattern seems to be a little bit, it's maybe slightly significant and a little bit more such that in the January to April period, there were 11 outbreaks in those 27. Uh, six of those occurred in La Nina, two in neutral. So this past year was a neutral phase, sort of we were a little bit of a quiet phase once we got out of January. May to December though, of the 16 outbreaks of the largest ones in that time frame, those tended to happen more in El Nino cases. So we were not in El Nino last year either. Um, and uh, this would be the, the time period that would sort of go out into the, the main central chasing area and then back into the Gulf Coast states 
uh, in the, in the uh, late Hustle period. So we were neutral to very weak La Nina throughout the year. Maybe that had some influence uh, on, the, on the year as a whole. Pacific decadal oscillation, I looked at the correlation between all tornadoes and the ones that are rated uh, two or stronger in intensity through 1950 to 2011 versus the uh, Pacific decadal oscillation. The correlations are not real high for the stronger tornadoes, it was negative, which means that the cooler temperatures right off of North America related to a little bit of an increase in the number for the whole year of uh, tornadoes, of stronger tornadoes, but the amount of year-to-year -year variability that it gets explained is the square of this correlation coefficient. So you square 0.34 and you only get about 0.1, so it's only explaining about 10% of the variation. It's pretty close to being insignificant, and uh, for the all tornadoes as a whole, that correlation was a little bit uh, low, and it didn't work very well. Uh, 2013 was, in fact, a negative PDO uh, year, but we did not have an above average. So every year, this predictability is, is low enough that it doesn't come out that way. Now, here's a couple of the things that people look at that relate to sort of atmospheric patterns, and uh, one of them is called the PNA, the Pacific North America uh, Anomaly. And basically the area we should focus here in is uh, sort of the uh, mid-level 500 millibar heights that are up on the western part of North America, the western part of the U.S., southwest parts of uh, Canada, and above average heights. So the ridge there in the positive phase, and when it gets into the negative phase, uh, more of a trough in that area. Now, just looking at that, you would probably think that this would be a little bit more favorable. You would have more southwest flow, the upper level jet stream coming across the central U.S. Uh, this case, you would think that a higher the west, you'd have more northwest flow. Uh, the results that I have uh, looked at then, looking at these 56 largest outbreaks, uh, pretty close to no relationship. 30 of the 56 were positive PNA, sort of more northwest flow situations, but that means 26 of the 56 were negative, so it's pretty darn close to having no impact. And the correlation uh, between the number of tornadoes in the outbreak slightly favors the, uh, the negative, the, the uh, it, it kind of goes the other way. The, the cold pockets in the west, you get have more tornadoes in the outbreaks when they happen. So, even the correlation coefficients between the, the, our outbreaks preferred versus our, the number of tornadoes, they don't uh, take the same kind of correlation coefficient. And if we use daily versus monthly values, the, the correlations even go down a little bit. So it uh, seems to have fairly an inconclusive, at least if, uh, maybe if you do it more in terms of a regional impact, uh, you would get some different results. But trying to look nationally in this quick look overview, I'm not seeing anything there that tells me that this is a very useful predictive tool. The North Atlantic Oscillation, that's one in which uh, when it's a positive phase, there's a bit of an enhanced jet stream that comes off of the northeast part of the U.S. over toward uh, Europe. When it's in a negative phase, instead of having more of a strong zonal jet stream, it's a more amplified U-shaped pattern. You might uh, think that that negative, well, I'm sorry, this is the Arctic Oscillation, another one of these jet stream patterns. When it is negative, it's one of these amplified. When it's positive, around the, basically the whole hemisphere, uh, if it's a more zonal west to east flow, that's a positive phase. So taking a look at those two, again, these outbreaks in the North Atlantic Oscillation, 31 of 56, meaning uh, when it's positive, NAO, the faster jet stream. So you got a little bit more wind energy, but Again, that means 25 or 56 are the other way. The correlation, not particularly high. And if you uh, uh, look at, dwell it down into some of the even higher impact days, the correlations reverse themselves. So again, it doesn't seem to give a very uh, consistent signal. Tornado outbreaks in the Arctic Oscillation, that's more around the whole uh, northern hemisphere, 30 of 56, when it's positive means it's 26 of 56 uh, the other way. Correlation very low, 
So I'm just uh, not seeing very much that is giving uh, long-term predictability. In fact, and we'll go through and look at a few cases here, and, and a few of some of the parameters that we've seen in John Davies' talk, we'll look at for a couple different kind of cases. Um, sometimes it's not even very easy on a particular day to see if it's going to be tornadic or not, let alone trying to use these climatic patterns um, months in advance to uh, indicate what it's, what's likely to happen. October 4th was one of those days, and uh, sort of di digressing for a moment, one of the things that we do at the Weather Channel to try to get uh, public attention and, and public awareness trying to uh, keep people safe is several days ahead of time trying to focus on some of the situations that may be upcoming that may be more dangerous. I know you're probably all checking the weather more than once a day, but a lot of the general public, they may only check every few days if something prompts them to take a quick look at the weather. And so we're trying to use what, I, what we've turned to TORCON, and that was part of our initiative, and Mike Bettis talked about Vortex 2, uh, we developed to, to go along that, we were going to go chasing them in the field, in the studio, we would talk about the, the likelihood of tornadoes uh, on those days. So we have a 0 to 10 scale, we call TORCON, that if you multiply by 10, that's essentially, roughly correlates to the likelihood, percentage-wise, of tornado within 100 miles. So we've had a couple of 10 days, uh, one of them was a super outbreak, 2011, 100%. Most of the time, it's in the 33-4 range, 30-40% chance of tornado within 50 miles. I think El Reno, more of those days were sort of in the 5-6 range. Some ingredients that uh, I, I look at going into those were positive, some not so dramatic. Uh, it's, it's not obvious uh, every day uh, that things are slammed up. October 4th, that was one of those days when there were questions. Would, there was a cap, a warm layer of loft, trying to inhibit thunderstorms. Would that break? Uh, or, uh, or I think that should be a dry feed. Uh, uh, <laughs> we were getting the loft over the, the dry line. Jeez, I've given this talk three times before and didn't see that until now. <laughs> the question was that, the, thank you, the computer models were saying that uh, there are going to be storms that form in Iowa, out under the moist, warm, moist axis, the theta E axis. Um, the dry line was back in the eastern parts of Nebraska, so there were questions of where. Um, there was Torcon, I, I sort of give about 50% upper level forcing, about 50% roughly in those low level capes that you heard John Davies talk about, and the low level turning in the winds and increase of height and helicity. This one wasn't especially strong in either of those. I think it was, I was giving in the four, five, six range. But the question was, was it Nebraska or Iowa? Uh, October 31st was a day that had extremely uh, low, limited instability, but very low shear. A six hour forecast at the Cape had only about 500 units of Cape in a very small area here, southeast Missouri. It wound up being, though, uh, one of these uh, tornado outbreak days. Different combinations of ingredients can wind up with the same kind of number of tornadoes and sometimes the same intensity of tornadoes. Looking at the October uh, uh, case, uh, 21Z on the 4th, the NAM uh, forecast uh, is showing, actually wound up being the better, best forecast this day. It had a little bullseye of this energy elicity index, the combination of the one kilometer cape and the one kilometer uh, storm relative elicity. Had a little bullseye up there in the northeast and east central corner of Nebraska. Like all the guidance, had bullseye of five, usually one or two. Two is sort of all you usually need uh, over in uh, Iowa. And then had a little tail down along uh, uh, the cold front or dry line down in the Kansas City area. The uh, Globe, oh, I put my initials instead of GFS, Global Forecast System. Uh, <laughs> Had the bullseye uh, over in uh, in southeast Nebraska, around Omaha, and out along the warm front, a, uh, another bullseye going out into Iowa under the richer moist feed, and the ruck model had uh, the bullseye all the way up into again into southeast Nebraska, and then up into Iowa and down into Kansas City. So uh, there were even a few hours ahead of time. 
uh, there were guidance, guidance differences that didn't agree then on all these little details that need to come together. So even uh, that's what really needs to happen and how much climatic or these large scale factors, almost global factors are involved, uh, I think are, are somewhat uh, unknown. What did happen that day was that basically all the, there was one maybe tornado, I guess, down near the Omaha area, but they were all up in that northeast Nebraska, northwest corner of Iowa. They were not over in the middle of the warm feed. There was some hail over there. They were back where the dry line kicked in. Here's a, a rough, a poor man's surface analysis with the dry line slash cold front, Pacific front coming in, southeast flow sort of maximized there, giving a little bit better uh, turning of the winds and, and helicity there on the Nebraska-Iowa border. You can see there the, the warm front with uh, more due east winds. So the, the rotation was there, the moisture was there, but the, the forcing in terms of low-level convergence was, was back in, the, in Nebraska. As a veteran, experience-wise, I should have put the bullseye in Nebraska that when in doubt, it's always sort of a little to the west. It's closer to the upper forcing. It's closer to the dry line. Uh, I was sort of leaning toward the richer uh, instability, at least the, the richer cape and trying to get away from the cap, in that case, had to kick the, uh, kick the Torcon west at the end. First tornado that broke out was, in fact, the farthest west of the bunch, back in some line, back up in this northwest going part of this frontal zone. Additional storms then fired up farther down in the southeast. They didn't form on the warm front. Storms quickly took these supercell hook echo uh, configurations with uh, rotation uh, in the uh, storm relative velocity. In this presentation, I, I'll uh, show some normalized rotation. The Gibson Ridge does a quantified measure of this, what you can see here is a pattern recognition shear to sort of quantify in the delta V over delta distance. So it can quantify and compare case to case. And when it gets up into the yellow or into the red, then these measures are getting to be higher uh, shear values, higher rotation values measured by the Doppler radar. Doing 2311 and 2331 in 20 minutes, that rotation is intensified. It has gone up and gone across the southern part of Wayne uh, here in Nebraska. You see a bit of a donut hole, the tornado inside of that, the red green <coughs> couplet, and the yellow, uh, this uh, rotation signature. In this case, it was kind of uh, a long distance in between the radars, uh, such that I think they were scanning up high enough above where the correlation coefficient, I was not getting a good signal on this case uh, from the correlation coefficient from the dual pole aspects of these radars. Uh, Tim Marshall talks about sliders. This, the EF4 rating for this tornado was not based on the slider house, but instead an industrial building that was pretty much collapsed, according to uh, the, the survey done by the National Weather Service Omaha. Uh, taking a look a little bit at that, uh, uh, as it continues on, it's cycled. You see a little bit of a flanking line, so it's wrapping up a little bit. Uh, the, uh, but uh, as John Davies pointed out, the, these storms sometimes cycle. One tornado will occlude, rain will wrap around it, rain cooled downdraft will wrap around it, and a new tornado will form out a little farther to the east in the warm air. Here's the old tornado and its circulation, the, what I'm calling original here in the, the red green couplet. Over near the Wakefield area, you see another red and green couplet. That is out near the, this little jut forward area where the forward flank downdraft, the rear flank downdraft is kicking the gust front east, and uh, another little, not real strong yet in this rotation signature. Uh, the next tornado in the family will come there, and uh, that cycling, as we, we sometimes call it, continued with additional tornadoes and uh, forming in that one. Again, not real well seen in the correlation coefficient. Just uh, taking a look a little bit, I guess this is another cell farther down in the southeast. A little, uh, maybe a debris signature down in the very southern ends of this rotating supercell with the tornado. And in this case, that normalized rotation, a red dot in there, very intense rotation. When you quantify it, the correlation coefficient not real well defined. And it too then goes in, wraps up, with the back in about uh, there. And again, you see a two couplets in the red and green. And the old one's still a yellow in the normalized rotation. The next one 
beginning to form a couple of miles farther to the east. So that's often a behavior in these storms that are somewhat high precipitation, the cool rain and a cool downdraft, roof like downdraft wraps around it, chokes off the tornado and a new one will form a couple miles to the east. You have to, uh, again, echoing some of the words we've heard here, uh, if you can recognize that, uh, uh, that this is one of those HP storms, back off a little bit, give yourself some room so the next one doesn't come down right on top of you. Uh, a little bit of upper air analysis of that one. The moist tongue here, the green shading at 850 millibars coming up more into Iowa. The tornado is right in the gradient where the dry line, very dry air pushing in with the uh, west and southwest winds at 850. At 500, a bit of a closed low, so the cold air was a little bit to the west. It's more the dynamics of the lifting coming in at 500 than it was directly cold air coming in. And at 300, right in the area where the, the a jet streak, the wind maximum, is coming in out of Colorado, blasting toward the area, more right exit region than, than left exit. Some, it was cooler back in the, the western South Dakota area. So uh, most of the time in these outbreak cases, it's the exit region and these jet streaks, but there were the differences from that even in 2013 that can happen. Uh, a representative sounding, the Omaha sounding, around the time that the tornado was occurring. Uh, pretty unstable, low level lapse rate, the temperatures going up here toward the left in red, the dew points pretty moist, uh, and no cap left. You see that one red dotted line there, a lot of positive area, the updraft temperature Cape values over 3,000 from the surface, influence of a little drier air coming in the mixed layer cable about 1,800. Uh, looking up in the upper right though, the hodograph, it's kind of an erratic uh, wind profile there. So the helicity in this case, uh, surface to one kilometer, pretty close to zero here, right at the Omaha sounding. I think it was a little bit stronger over in those uh, southeast winds just to the north of the Omaha area. Sometimes there's multiple disjointed areas. This is the case of October 31st, the Halloween tornado outbreak, the largest Halloween outbreak on record. Uh, warm front in the morning coming down across the Louisiana area. Fairly subtle, but a lot of very moist air coming in. Fairly subtle, any kind of convergence, but 20 knot surface winds. There's a lot of shear down there. And by 8.50, uh, we veered around to 40, 45 knot southwesterly winds. So a lot of low level shear. Tremendous amounts, a little of the moisture uh, at surface and 850. At 500 uh, in the morning, it's still though pretty warm at, at 500 millibars. The cold pocket is way back there in the Texas Panhandle. So a lot of low level cape, a lot of low level shear, not very much in the way of upper level forcing in the morning, but at the low level jet managing to touch off tornadoes in the morning. In fact, if you look at the Lake Charles sounding in the morning, contrast that to that Omaha case that I just showed and very little difference between the, the uh, parcel temperatures it rises and the sounding. Uh, about 1,600 units of cape from the surface to about 1,000 from the mixed layer. The helicity though, look at the hodograph in the upper right. Pretty fast winds and very quickly uh, just uh, less than 1,000 feet above the ground going up to about 50 knots there. And uh, so the, the storm relative helicity 331 or so. So this is sort of the other end of the extreme, low cape, or moderate cape in this case, and high elicity. And we did have tornadoes that were forming down in this squall line in the morning hours in Louisiana. The upper low kicking east across uh, from the Texas Panhandle toward Kansas and Missouri. By evening, some of the storms there in the uh, western part of the Midwest began to fire up with a second round of tornado activity. So. In fact, today wound up with three disjointed areas of tornadoes, a morning cluster down not too far away from Lake Charles, an early evening cluster in the Missouri, Iowa, uh, sorry, Missouri, Illinois, Kentucky area, a little bit of Arkansas, and then a nighttime cluster there in Ohio, up along with a low-level jet was hitting into the, to the warm front. Uh, the 500 in the morning, as I showed you, the upper low and the strong trough was back in the Texas Panhandle, but it was racing, in fact, maybe going a little negative tilted, such that by evening, it had raced all the way into the Mississippi Valley there and gotten to close to the St. Louis area. And that is the, what we sometimes call the ingredients coming together with 
the moisture flowing north and the upper forcing coming into that area, that's what triggered then that middle bout of, uh, of storms. And that upper forcing continued with a low jet gave the evening rounds then in parts of Ohio. The zero Z in the evening uh, surface map, cold front pushing its way east, beginning to get 60 dew points coming in off the Gulf of Mexico all the way up there into the Ohio Valley, fueling those, those evening storms. And pretty strong jet stream, in this case, pretty hard to say exit or entrance, but a wind maximum coming right over the area there that in the evening was having the tornadoes around the Missouri, Illinois area. 850, there's about a 75, maybe even 80 knot low level jet coming up into Ohio to fuel the after dark tornadoes. Interesting storm structures though, you can get in these kind of situations varying storm structures. Sometimes little line segments that will begin to pivot themselves forward into sort of supercell wannabe appearances. This one down around this Creole Springs area, a little bit of a donut hole, and uh, there's some rotation there, not extremely strong, but there was a tornado there, an EF1 uh, right in that vicinity of that donut hole. But again, then down in the lower diagrams, uh, also a comma cloud with rotation down on the south edge of that comma head area, south of uh, Essex, west of the Petterman area. Uh, there was an EF2 tornado in there near Baker. Uh, not a hugely strong normalized rotation, this one, but uh, a couple of different locations where tornadoes can occur. That Creole Springs, though, was a little closer to one of the radars, that donut hole there just south of Creole Springs. If you look in the correlation coefficient in this case, there are blue values in there, the kind of very low correlation coefficients that are indicative of tumbling debris. So this one had the tornado debris signature verifying when the perhaps the velocity signatures themselves were a little bit on the questionable side whether there was tornado in progress. The extreme though of sort of the low in, 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 insta, oops, low instability, uh, high shear environment, you know, I mentioned those rounds of tornadoes overnight in Ohio. The evening sounding at Bloomington, Ohio, down in southwest Ohio, virtually no Cape, moist adiabatic all the way up. Cape was zero, in fact, uh, surface and mixed layer. But the storm relative velocity with that low level jet, look at, darn, the low level jet uh, uh, hodograph there, really veering around. It's sort of a classic uh, for a tornado kind of environment. 756 units in the, of helicity in the lowest kilometer. So it had about the extreme of one end of the high helicity, very low shear, but that combination still gave some tornadoes. Now, when I want to advance to this one, we, uh, we finally able to do it. I'll only say a couple of words uh, about this. Mike has shown you the before and after of the tornado hunt vehicle. I had been out with Mike the previous week. I was back in the studio uh, for this one, and uh, I would have been uh, normally riding right there behind the driver uh, and would probably have been pretty well battered up uh, had I been there for this particular tornado. Mike showed you some video. I've pulled off a, a still here uh, of, of one of the frames of that video as they're racing south. And I'm, we're not even catching the left edge of the tornado there. Big wide tornado, as you know, coming. But rounding the front edge, you can see one darker area. John Davies was showing some of these. There's one multiple vortex or suction vortex, as Dr. Fujita would have called them. A second one, this number one is probably going westbound, rounding the front and about to go back onto the west side. Number two, as far as I can see, is still going forward toward the front side. Number three, bigger and less well defined but going very fast toward the north. That's on the, uh, the eastern edge of the tornado in the, in the southerly flow going fast. So there's no doubt that there were, and we saw other many videos that showed that. Uh, by the way, uh, we know there were four chasers. Uh, there were at least four other civilians killed. As far as I know, they were not chasers. At least two of them were just trying to get home from, from work. Uh, this was a bad day for, uh, for being in a vehicle. I had begun the day, in fact, saying that this was going to be a dangerous day for chasing. It's going to be HP, high precipitation supercells, a lot of rain wrap. 
The first storms that went up were about three of them very close together. They were starting to get filaments of precipitation wrapping from the ones to the south to the north. And, uh, and, and you know the, well, and the area where it was in with a lot of chasers and a lot of traffic congestion making for dangerous day. It's very pleased to see the tribute that uh, in the GPS indicators that was given to Tim and, and Paul and Carl. Uh, we had another chaser, a Richard Charles Henderson, that was uh, his last photo that I've pulled here from the Oklahoma of, of the tornado uh, as he saw it. Uh, so that's really about all I want to say. You've heard um, John Davies. As far as I can tell, and, and we'll hear a lot more about it, but I think the rear flank downdraft played a huge role uh, in the, the motion and the intensification, the change of direction. Uh, and uh, Tom Bolin uh, has some presentation back in the, uh, of a hail shaft collapsing ahead of that that may have had a lot to do with that rear flank downdraft. Uh, I was with Mike Bettis. We were not on the Moore tornado. We were uh, a little bit to the south, as, as many people were, I guess. We saw the debris ball forming up in the Moore area. We weren't anxious to go chasing up in the Moore area, but we knew that with, there was going to be some destruction. So as, as you heard, uh, we were able to we abandoned our chase to the south and, and went up into the Moore area, where we were then the covering aftermath. Uh, and uh, we were there not immediately after, we were there as quick as about anyone, but you can still see that it was a very active scene. Mike is broadcasting live, sometimes I was with him, sometimes I was walking around looking for stories that we could tell for the next uh, uh, broadcast and getting an inventory of, of sort of what had gone on here. Uh, people were still, at that time, uh, looking amidst the rubble, the property owners trying to salvage things. I believe there was a... Uh, there was one fatality in this area. It may have been in this pile of rubble here. There were none in the school. Uh, we were just east of Briarwood Elementary School. Uh, these were the kind of scenes that, that we saw there. Some of the, the girders from the elementary school blown into the residential areas. Uh, obviously, all the, the concrete block walls had tipped over. Uh, bent high beams, piles of debris that were about 10 feet high. Certainly, I'm thinking that this is an EF4 kind of a tornado. I'm looking through the, the damage to see if I see anything that really catches my attention. And one of those gee whiz moments was, my goodness, what is this? This is huge. I didn't, I, it must have been 20 feet long. It weighed 10 tons. Went a water tank or a propane tank that had flown in from a, from a farm about a half mile away, as, as we now understand. Uh, gone over the school and landed there in the residential area. So this did not seem to me to be something that would have been in the midst of this residential area. So I went and was talking to some of the residents and they said, oh no, this wasn't there, it flew in. So this was something that caught my attention. I, you know, as many years as I've been looking at damage since the 70s, I've never seen things like this happen. So this made me think that we were dealing with a, a five tornado. Uh, we, we saw cars that were mangled and, and tossed around. Fortunately, the search and rescue dogs were making their second round through to, to make sure there were no bodies in the rubble. So we were there when, when all of this was pretty fresh. Uh, the, this was a case where we had some EHI bullseyes. The, the uh, six-hour forecast of the ruck were giving a bullseye down in Oklahoma City, but there were some others as well up along a, a frontal zone up in Missouri. And, even down into some of the Texas area. Uh, the significant tornado parameter forecast, the biggest bullseye was down around the Oklahoma City area. Uh, the, the Arkansas, I believe, turned out to be mostly false alarms. There were a few tornadoes up in the Missouri. And uh, uh, a comparable sounding at 17Z, a little bit before things began to break out. We had a bit of a cap. You guys talk about the cap. So there's the very moist nearly saturated layer down in the area below 850 millibars. Then that red nose up to the right there, that's the warm layer loft. It's inhibiting that moist air from rising yet until something breaks that cap. But once the cap breaks, you see that huge positive area off to the right of the sounding with about close to 5,000 units of cape 
uh, in this sounding from the surface and over 3,000 from the mixed layer. Not the, as we've heard though, not the huge of storm relative velocities, 130 or so. The hodograph to the upper right has some curvature. The speeds though are a little on the slow side, slower than some of the typically bigger outbreak days. So this had, this was one of those that was on the high cape, low to moderate helicity kind of combinations. The zero Z sounding though showed a different situation. The cap is gone. Uh, there's a little less perhaps cape now. Some of the thunderstorms maybe have contaminated things a little bit. This interesting little kink in the hodograph though with a little bit of an increase of the speed by maybe uh, 10 or so uh, knots uh, has uh, increased the helicity up to 269. So some subtle things happening there to make this uh, kind of the best of both worlds in terms of that one EF5 tornado that uh, obviously was extremely damaging. Uh, it had a very well-defined debris ball, as you've probably seen, down at the very base of the very elongated hook, and I'm sure we'll see some of uh, the bubbled up on some of these that have even more interesting structures. The, the velocities and then that normalized rotation I've been talking about that quantifies that shear uh, with the red bullseye there, looking, uh, comparing the, the red, comparing the reflectivity with the debris ball down to below that, the white correlation coefficient, just about the same size, the debris uh, signature in the uh, dual pole may be slightly larger, maybe a little bit of beginning to get some centrifuging out of the debris and it got even larger with time. It was a day when we, it was a day when we had uh, tornadoes in Oklahoma, we had some tornadoes in a number of other states kind of along that funnel zone. Little bits of, as, as John has showed, little bits of kinks in the turn, but the worst of it coming right about in that area as it came across uh, on the, the west side of Moore. Uh, a little bit of an evolution here began as a, I keep missing my uh, pointer, a little bit of an evolution there of an open hook turning very quickly within over the next 20 minutes into that debris ball, and then the debris ball continuing for another 12 or 13 minutes pass to the east of Moore and then beginning to lose some of that structure as it got farther uh, toward the end of the tornado off farther to the east. Aloft, uh, not an extremely strong uh, surface situation, front coming down into the area, there were some subtle boundaries. At 850, a little bit of a drier air pushing in, warmer air, a little bit of a cap down to the south. You see the, the dash lines there sort of oriented west to east. So the, it was capped down in Texas, uh, not so capped farther to the north. Not extremely strong winds though at 850. 500, a bit of a trough coming into the area. 300, uh, the jet street, the exit area was way up into the Great Lakes. So we were sort of a situation where the jet stream was just over the region, neither entrance or exit as I could tell. The day before, uh, we, uh, I'll go back here in time, the day before, we had uh, a deadly tornado around the Shawnee, Bethel Acres, Oklahoma area here. Uh, well defined, if you're in a position to see it, well defined, large tornado there, courtesy of Bill Hart. And uh, we, we were uh, up uh, originally in the area a little bit to the north in Wichita, looking at tornadoes that were being reported up in there and moved south. We were, were able to get into the damage. The next morning, the scene was just devastating, and it looked like a horde of bulldozers had gone through the mobile home park and just flattened everything. Uh, really sad and really amazing that just, uh, I believe it was two people died in, the, in that uh, scene of destruction. One spot there where it really got most intense, even a little pixel there in the storm relative velocity where the mean velocity couldn't be resolved, and even a purple in the normalized rotation, very strong shear. Uh, across that, in that debris ball signature. Uh, we've gone back a day, the EHIs uh, in the six hour forecast suggesting anywhere from Oklahoma up into southeast Kansas, which is where we were sort of targeting. Uh, and uh, the significant tornado parameter was a little bit to higher up in that uh, Kansas area. But uh, the, again, the proximity sounding a little bit before, again, had one of those caps, but just huge amounts of cape, again, close to 5,000. Helicities, 
sort of low to moderate though, 147 or so, some churning in the hodograph. So it was, again, had mixtures of the combination. Several uh, tornadic supercells in this day, and the supercell here forming very quickly between 02 and 06, beginning to get this debris ball signature, and then uh, wrapping up into even a better defined by the time we get to uh, 27, and that red uh, rotation, uh, very strong as it came right into the Bethel Acres area. Swarm to the north, another supercell with a debris ball up uh, closer to the Chandler and Edmond area, had a tornado as well. Some of you I know were, were chasing that. Not quite as strong, uh, well, again, at its peak, very well defined, a very strong rotation signature on that one, and a little bit of the life cycle of that one. A hook quickly wrapping itself into that debris ball uh, with that very strong rotation, and then uh, rear flank down raft, it, it quickly cycled and, and uh, uh, weakened tornadoes on that case with the frontal zone, Oklahoma, Kansas, all the way up into Iowa. Uh, this was the case, though, where the exit region was just coming in. So dynamics-wise, this seemed like it was the day probably that had the, the best upper air forcing in terms of uh, divergence up in that, what would be mainly left exit region, for Kansas at least. Not extremely strong, upper air forcing though at 500 millibars. And go back yet one more day, a day where we were able to have a more fun chase with not such a terrible outcome to it. Uh, we were, were able to see, Mike Bettis and, and the Tornado Hunt team, we were able to see a couple of tornadoes uh, just past where the, the EF-4 hit Roselle, uh, a roping out land spot. Uh, with, we, we filmed it live on air as the tornado overhead, was, uh, rotation was right over top of us, and then another uh, tornado uh, land spot formed and scooted down pretty close to us and headed down to the southwest. Uh, we were up in the, in the Kansas area that day, so uh, a, a day with mostly fun tornadoes, only basically one uh, uh, home that was hit. Uh, but again, a day that even had weaker EHIs, threes, a little bit, a couple of spots, significant tornado parameters, not real high. Uh, but again, a day that had huge amounts of Cape, in this case, of close to 6,000 amounts of Cape, and again, the helicities only about 137, so different combinations. And uh, in this case, the, the radar, not as well defined, a, a supercell hook echo structure, but wrapping itself up briefly here into this, into this hook. Uh, rotation signature not extremely strong. Quickly getting wrapped up as the whole gust front kicks out farther to the east, the tornado back in that uh, of what you might think of as an occluded location, and a very strong rotation there, and then uh, additional circulations forming out in this gust front area, which is where we were able to catch uh, the, the tornado. The original circulation still back where this red dot is, additional tornadoes forming, uh, circulations forming a couple spots out to the east. There's still the, uh, one of the, the second one intensifies here, and additional ones to the third, so we were sort of catching these additional couple of circulations farther out to the east. And interestingly, the, the Roselle tornado did have, uh, at its peak there, the red dot is Roselle, there's the traditional storm relative velocity and some debris signature uh, showing up there. And I, I think at that point we'll, we'll pause and uh, take any questions if we have time. Thanks. My voice is mostly held up. I'll take it, otherwise, we'll turn it over to Roger. Questions somewhere? There's a person. Uh, what, what is your outlook for this season based on what you've seen so far? Well, it's hard to make an outlook. What I'm seeing so far is sort of, we've all, we're already off to a slow start, and with still the, the expectation we're kind of in neutral, uh, we're probably not going to get a, a massive uh, number of tornadoes. In the, through the end of February. It looks like the pattern's getting more favorable, though, but probably in the January to April period is going to be at best average. 
so I would think that probably we'll have about an average year unless, uh, but I don't think there's very much predictability in that. We still have some drought areas that might, uh, might um, slide things a little bit to the east unless the spring rains change that pattern. But uh, I, I just don't think there's a whole lot of skill, skill in being able to bring this over. Who at the Weather Channel gets to name the uh, winter storms right now? <laughs> <laughs> the question was, uh, uh, who names the, the winter storms at the Weather Channel? There's a, there's a panel of... Uh, Sorry, Dr. Greg. Guys, don't leave the room if you want to get meal ticket for tonight. Come back in if you want your meal ticket for the banquet tonight. Sorry. Otherwise, you don't get a meal. You go hungry. Yeah. There's, a, there's a team of, uh, including Tom Nizzle and a couple of the behind-the-scenes meteorologists from the, in our Global Forecast Center, and Stu Oster, our senior meteorologist, and then some others that decide whether or not to name the winter storms. Uh, the set of names for specifically this year, in my recollection, was that they were sent in by a school class. Uh, and so the list of names we've sometimes gotten sent in from the public and, and, and used those. But the decision whether or not to name is done by a team uh, at the Weather Channel. Is, uh, is there any plans on naming Atlantic blows currently uh, affecting uh, England. And can I coin the uh, term uh, cold core hurricane? Uh, I, I don't, I haven't looked closely enough at what's going on. The question was about the naming of the lows that are out of the Atlantic heading toward England. Uh, my understanding of our philosophy is that we'll not, we will not be, we're naming on the basis of storm on the basis of impact to the United States. The Europeans, though, for many years have given names to some of their winter storms, so they may give uh, some name to that. Uh, and I have not looked at the current situation enough to know anything about uh, what's, what the character of the storms out of the Atlantic are alternative. <laughs> Oh, there was a question about the drought. Uh, well, to the, as long as there's a bit of a drought there, uh, what will happen will be then, as long as that persists, the, the, the sun's energy will come in and will give more heating than it normally would because there's less moisture in the soil, less vegetation there. So other, some of the sun's energy that would have gone into the transpiration the, being used up by the crops will instead heat the ground and heat the air in the uh, with that, what you might expect then from that would be there'll be a little bit warmer layer of off. The cap will be a little bit stronger, and if there's a southwest flow, it'll push a little bit uh, off to the east. So that uh, I often think that if there's a still a very uh, places where the drought is in place, there may be some tendency to push the tornado corridor over toward the edge. What we, we've known for many years that tornadoes like to occur on a day-to-day -day basis at the edge of the cap, where you first, where the upper air forcing was first hitting into the moist air instability. So my thinking in sort of the longer, larger scale or longer time period is that the edges of those where that cap will slide a little bit off of that drug area will be the probably favorite corridors for tornadoes. But it can vary from, from day to day. You can have moisture back into those dry areas uh, from the southeast flow and, and, and still get some tornadoes in those dry areas. Don't put much confidence in it. The question was uh, why such a high death count in uh, 2013 with the tornado count being low, and and I think it is it's it's like hurricanes. It's not how many, but where they hit. And we had uh, tornadoes, violent tornadoes, going through metro areas. Um, and, and we know anyway from the general statistics that it's not the zero and one tornadoes. They make up 90% or so of the tornado count for the year. It's those twos and especially threes and hires that cause the fatalities. And so it's largely where they hit the odd. And in particular this year, it was, uh, 
I think the low mobile home count was that we were, we were not getting so many of those moderate intensity tornadoes hitting mobile home parks. We were getting big long track violent tornadoes that hit highly urbanized areas. You want to break for, break for lunch? Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, hey folks, before we leave this, the room, uh,